Functions are a very integral part of programming in C++ and so in this video and the next few that follow we're going to talk about functions more specifically. And I'm going to start off in this video with some basics about functions and first of all let's answer the simple question just what exactly is a function? Well a function is a named block of code. The name we give this block of code identifies that code and then we use that name to invoke or to call the function or in other words whenever we want all these lines of code to be executed we simply put the name of the function in our code and the compiler knows to go find that particular group of code that's been named and to run it. Now when we're creating our functions we have the same naming rules that we do when we're creating our variables. First thing, your function can have letters, numbers, and even the underscore character in the name, but the first character must be a letter. You can't start it off with a number, all right? And you shouldn't do an underscore. Now, underscores are something that some people love and use quite a bit. Uh, they're something that can get you taken out to the parking lot by other people. And taking out to the parking lot is a southern technical term for not a good thing, all right? Now, the function's name should reflect what it does. Don't call your functions things that don't tell you what they do. For example, the count orders function should be a function that invokes a few lines of code that actually counts orders. All right? This makes it very easy to troubleshoot your code. It makes it very easy to read your code. And another example is reorder. When we call the reorder function, we should generally be able to assume safely that some sort of reordering is being done. Okay, maybe we're going to reorder a product or we're going to reorder a list or whatever's going on. But it's good coding practice to name the function what it does. Now, a function really should only do one thing. If you create a function that does 26 different things, you're going to have a problem when you come back and try to make changes to your code later because you could break all 26 of those things. Now, let me give you some very, very basic stuff that you need to have in your brain and be very comfortable with some terminologies. First of all, what you see on the screen here is a function definition. So when you define a function, there are some things that you're adding here that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But this is what a function definition looks like right here. All right. Now, in specifics, let me talk about a couple of things here. First of all, you will notice that there is a return portion. Now this is saying that when we run add numbers, we're going to do some sort of functionality and this return is what's going to be sent back to whatever called this function. And what it's going to return is a data type of integer right here. All right, so let me get all that off the screen and uh, let's move on. Now parameters, this is very important. When I create my function and when I define my function like this, notice this is the name of my function, add numbers. When add numbers runs, I need to pass or include in the call to add numbers two parameters, all right? I need to provide two integers. And whatever I provide is going to be loaded into an integer called x and into an integer called y, all right? Now, what I'll usually do first is create this code and then somewhere else in the code I will create this code down here. And notice this code calls this particular function. All right, so you've got add numbers right here, add numbers 2, 3, and this simply, notice, calls this function add numbers. The 2 gets loaded into the x. The 3 gets passed or loaded into the y. The x gets passed into the function and used. The y gets passed into the function. And these two together get returned. Okay? So the return takes everything, makes it a data type of int or integer, and passes it back out and loads it into C. All right? Now, I've made a mess here with arrows, okay, and boxes. But go back and watch this real slow and you will see how this actually works. Now there is an aspect of our function call down here that you need to see and this confuses people. Now when I created my function up here and I defined it, 
I indicated that I was looking for an x to be passed in, some sort of value as an integer, and then a variable y, something that's going to be loaded into y, and it needed to be an integer data type. Well, then when I call that function, I'm going to include those, but when I call it, it's, they're called arguments. So I'm passing two arguments in based on the two parameters that my definition has, okay? Now, just like I showed you a couple of minutes ago, uh, 2 is going to get loaded into x. These are positional. Since 2 is the first one, it's going into the first parameter. And since 3 is my second argument, it's going into the second parameter, okay? And then those get used right inside my function, okay? Now that's the basic parts of a function. If you can understand how you create a function, then how you call it, and then you can understand parameters and arguments, you got it. Now it can get a lot more complicated than this. I'll hint at some of that a little bit later on, but make sure you get this terminology down and you're going to be on your way. Now function prototypes are something that you're probably not used to. And so let's talk about them here. You're going to have to deal with these in C++. And depending on how you write your code, you may not have to deal with them, but you need to understand what's going on, and you really need to understand why you should deal with them, okay? You're going to hear about prototypes, and if you go out on the internet and do some digging around, you will see all kinds of questions about prototypes. Well, let me kind of explain a little bit, and then we'll go look at an example and come back and finish up. A function prototype simply informs the compiler a little bit about the function that's going to be used somewhere else in the program. Now, a function prototype contains the name of the function, the parameter types that are being expected by the function, and then the function return type. Okay? Now, why do we need these? Well, the best way to explain that is to actually go out and look at some code. All right? Now, here's just a very simple little prototype example, and you'll notice this is going to be, by the way, in your work files folder. It's called prototype example. Uh, how cool is that? And what a coincidence, right? And then you'll see there's a PROTEX CPP file, and that's where we're at right now. Now, notice what's going on here. I've got a very simple little C++ program here. Here's my main function. This is where it's all going to start. And notice we are going to create an integer and set it equal to 45 or initialize it at a value of 45. Then we're just going to call our standard console outline and then we're going to call a function called test and we're going to pass it an argument of C which we know equals 45. Now the parameter on the actual definition of the function is right here. Notice it is looking for test an integer to be passed in. It's going to go in as A and it's simply going to return it back out to C right here, okay? And so this is going to result in a return of an integer and it's just going to put it in place of this, all right? Now, if I run this, let me show you what's going to happen, all right? Pretty straightforward and I'll go out there. I've already gotten the right place here and I'll call prototype function. There's 45. There's my answer, all right? No big surprise there. But I want you to see something. If I don't use this prototype right here, and notice what this prototype does. It simply tells the compiler, okay, at some point in this program down here, dude is going to be using, uh, dude being a southern technical term for programmer, it's going to be using a test function, a function named test. It's going to return an integer and it's going to expect an integer to be passed in. All right, and sure enough, if you look down here, there it is. All right, now if I change this to character, okay, and I try to compile this, uh, I'm going to uh, see some interesting things happen. It says, wait a minute, whoa, 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 you got a problem here. You got a problem, all right, and notice it's showing me some unresolved externals, all right, and notice it's having a problem here with test and character and so forth. And so this is basically telling it, wait a minute, dude, you're, you're saying you're going to use one of these, but this is not what I see. And so when I correct that back, I can see it. Now I can hear some of you yelling at the monitor, wait a minute, I've never used these before. What's the deal? Well, this is telling the compiler that one's coming up. All right, I'm going to take this off and I'm going to comment this out. 
and this is probably what's been happening to you. If I try to debug this, or if I try to run this, it's going to throw another error. And what is it going to say? It's going to say that the test identifier is not found. And what it's talking about here, it says, wait a minute, you're trying to call a test here. Well, I don't see it because it's defined in the program after you're trying to use it. Well, notice if I highlight this and drag it up before main, all right, and then I run it, notice I don't have any problems. It compiles up, it runs, everybody is happy. All right, now what's going on here? Well, we didn't need a prototype here because it was in order the compiler found it and checked it, all right? But what we really want to do is use the prototypes because the prototypes add further checking into the process so that the compiler can make sure that we pass things in. Now let me show you one other thing. The only thing that has to match as far as the parameters is the type. The actual name, let me undo that, the actual name of the variable does not have to match. Okay, notice that's going to compile without a problem. All right, didn't get any errors. Now here's what we can do with that. This test right here, integer A, I can put little notes up here and I can tell it that what I'm testing here is the number, let me make this a little easier to read, the number of gallons. And so even though we're just passing in, we're accepting A down here in our actual definition of the function, in our prototype up here, we're being a little bit more explicit about exactly what that parameter is. Now this is a cool little trick because it can help you understand what's going on, but you don't have to write this little novel here of number of gallons every time you use this thing, or you have to use it down here, okay? And again, this will compile up, no big deal, all right? So that's what a prototype is, okay? Now, uh, let's jump back out to here and talk about why we need these. Well, it allows the compiler to check the function for errors when you call it, it also allows the compiler to perform certain housekeeping tasks in the background. Now this has to do with linking and changing your code later and how it's managed at machine level and all that. And I don't want to go into that right here, but trust me, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. Now there's another thing I can hear some of you guys yelling at the monitor, and that is, why aren't they used in like C Sharp and VBNet and other things? Well, they are, you just don't see them. Microsoft's doing some coding for you in the background in those examples. And so any language where you're using functions and you're not doing prototypes, understand that when you compile, it's happening. Now, this all goes back to, to some early history and, and single pass compilers and all that stuff. But all I want you to take from this is what function prototypes are and why you should use them.